There we go. <laughs> bonjour, bonjour, mes amis, and welcome to everyone here. Welcome, welcome. We're so delighted to have you here with us this evening. Um, we have quite the conversation in store for you. Uh, we're going to be talking about stress, which I feel like many people from just expressions even on my panelist's face, we talk about this a lot, but I'm hoping this evening we can really drill down to what exactly it is. I, I feel like it's almost become a word that doesn't have much meaning anymore, kind of like inflammation. It's a buzzword. Everyone hears about it. We know it's really bad. But if you, if I asked you for the definition of it, could you give it to me? I don't know. I'd love to hear some definitions of stress in the box. Um, so while, while I'm just about to introduce our panel here, but before that, again, as usual, we really encourage you to fill out the poll that we have, as well as toss some comments into the chat. Let us know where you're from. We want to make sure this conversation is serving you this evening. Um, if you have a particular form of stress you want us to be talking about, if you have a particular relaxation technique you want us to be talking about, specific genes and how they play out in you, we want to make sure we're serving who's here this evening. Um, so as we're introducing ourselves, please do do let us know who you are and, and what you care about. Um, and so with no further ado, ladies, uh, Dr. Varden, Dr. Sapp, welcome, welcome, welcome. It's so delightful to have us back together again. How are you guys this evening? Doing I'm doing quite well. Quite well, yeah. How about you, Dr. Kosterman? <laughs> I am unstressed. <laughs> I'm moderately stressed. Due to physical <laughs> factors, which we'll get into. <laughs> oh, interesting. I love that you're already delineating the psychologic versus the biologic stress because I <laughs> I think that's Talk important. It it's an time. important delineation. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 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 No. Where's my stress level? I think my stress level is at a moderate. Not too bad. Not, but you know, there's there's yeah. enough keeping me going. <laughs> <laughs> and a little bit is a good thing. Too well, that's another thing that we might yeah. want to touch on. I like that. Yeah, little bits of stress. So so why don't we, I guess, just as people are collecting answers, as people are offering into the chat what they care about, who they're here, what they're here to learn about, right? Why don't we start offering some definitions or at least some working ideas around what stress is, right? Because I think we hear about sometimes stress in the biology, you know, what exactly is stress within the body? And then we also hear it more often within the mind and our experience of the world. So Ladies, I guess, how do you go about defining stress um, and kind of what are the funnier definitions that you've heard people people offer around this is what I think stress is? Yeah, I, I end up talking to my patients a lot about stress, go figure. Mm -hmm. um, and about 90% of my patients at this point are female. Mm -hmm. um, and I see a lot of high cortisol and a lot of low cortisol. Um, mm -hmm. And when I talk to people about stress, it's basically uh, the body's response to any um, physical or mental demand or challenge. So it can be due to toxins in the environment, due to viral load, due to inflammation, a buzzword, or it can be um, mental. But I talk about the biopsychosocial model a lot. Um, mm -hmm. I work in primary care, but I do have a focus on mental and cognitive health. So it really mm -hmm. helps people to understand like, um, sometimes people will kind of roll their eyes if their doctor says stress, right? Because yeah. it's often used as a way to sort of gaslight people. Like you don't have a, a physical problem. It's just stress, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but that means a lot of different things. For some people, it means mental stress. Other, it means physical stress. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's true. A lot of things do come down to stress when you define it as broadly as it can be. So, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I think, I think it's, and Dr. Varden's usually a bit quicker on the statistics around this, but um, I think it's, it's being more and more recognized even within conventional settings as not only contributors to things like heart attack, stroke, and kind of those big scary things, but also cancer, right? Some of those more intangible things, aside from just kind of the quality of life, that more je ne sais quoi intangible side of it all. Yeah. Well, I mean, speaking of some stats, <laughs> oh, here we go. I love it. <laughs> it is uh, the from the American Psychological Association. They say that approximately 77% of Americans report experiencing physical symptoms related to stress and 73% yeah. report physiological or I'm sorry, psychological symptoms. And I mean, this can 
really impact a lot of different things. I mean, they even broke it down to going, okay, well, you know, where do these concerns or stresses lie? 64% were financial concerns, 60% yeah. were work related, 46% health related, those were really the most common stressors. I yeah. mean, it's, it is something that should not be ignored. And we need to take it from that amorphic, you know, thing, and really put it into tangible understandings, you know, to yeah. really define going, okay, what is stress? Like, you know, what Dr. Sapp just so beautifully explained. And then, you know, well, well, what about us, each of us? How do we experience that stress? stress? Yeah. How do we process that? And a lot of that, what we're going to be talking about is genetic dispositions. Yeah. What our profiles are really leans into that, but it's also a matter of learned responses, you know, coping mechanisms, traumas yeah. that we have had can also strongly impact the way that we perceive stress, the way that we, um, the way that we experience it and the way that we respond or react as the case may be to it. Um, yeah. And I know we're going to be talking about different ways of how stress is activated, things like, and I'm sure many of you have heard, you know, that fight, flight, or freeze response, <laughs> yeah. you know, and, and it's not like we always fall into one bucket or the other, we can actually bounce between different responses, but that, but overall, we tend to lean into one more than the other. Yeah, agreed. Yeah. And now they've added in a fourth fawn. I don't know if you're familiar with that one. I have heard of it. But yeah. I'm not sure where exactly they have the meaning to that. And, and sometimes when you're in a stress yeah. state, it's like, who cares? I'm stressed. Oh <laughs> yeah. 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 Great. Yeah. But I think, I think I love that at least what we'll be discussing tonight is the genetic underpinning. Cause I, I find when I work with clients, them simply knowing this is how I will experience and may respond to that becomes almost the the foundation from where they can work to better their stress response, right? There's an element of like, oh, this is just how I'm set up. Cool. I now know, have tools and awareness of how to work around that. So it's almost like stress response plans and stress management plans need to very much be curated to the individual and how they are receiving it. Mine might be very different from Adelia's, which might be very different from Lara's. Yeah. 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 That's, I find that very true. So in terms of the environment and the um, genetic predisposition, predispos some people like the clients that come in and they say, oh, I don't have stress, tend to be what we call in psychology, alexithymic, but they also tend to be people who somatize and get physical symptoms mm -hmm. from their stress. Um, mm -hmm. And that may also be related to temperament. I mean, they may have really great cognitive and mental mm -hmm. health genes, but they're more likely under stress to get, you know, cardiovascular inflammation or metabolic yeah. issues, uh, or maybe even detox issues. I mean, the yeah. list goes on. So it's really just a matter of how it registers. Uh, yeah. It always registers in one system or another. Unfortunately, I love it. I love what you just said there, because I think in particular, in the beginning of my practice, I worked with a lot of very high performing men and they would come into my practice and I'd be like, okay, cool. Like, let's talk about stress. And they'd see me and they'd be like, I don't need to talk about anything woo woo with you. I'm fine. And I'm yeah. like, okay, well, you have a, you know, you're a C-suite, you're a this, you're a that, like, that's a stressful job. And they're like, yeah, whatever. And I'm like, okay, cool. How do you know when you're stressed? And they're like, I don't know. And I'm like, okay, well, does your partner ever tell you that you yell at them during, you know, when tax returns are due or insert business thing, right? And they're like, oh yeah, I guess they do say that. And does that, yeah. does your sleep patterns change at that point? Well, yeah, but I have a lot of work to do. But if you're lying in bed, are you able to fall asleep? And they're like, but no. And so it's very interesting sometimes that a lot of people don't necessarily register and that's in part, there's elements of different generations, right? Some generations weren't really educated around what exactly is stress, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think to my mom, right? Like my mom is, does not look at, she owns it so well. She's in her early seventies. And she tells me that 
she had to learn the idea that stress could impact physical health because when she was growing up, that wasn't something that was known or at least commonplace knowledge. That was something that she had to acquire. And, you know, hearing me come home and say, oh, I had a really bad day and I don't feel well, you know, like my stomach hurts or something like that. And she'd be like, that doesn't make sense. And again, it wasn't that she didn't care. It's just that she had been trained so differently. She was taught about the world in such a different way. Yeah, absolutely. There's a huge generational difference also. Like I'm starting to see more and more Gen Zs and yeah. the new statistic oh. is approximately 50%. I know this sounds wild, but it's around 50% of youths in the U.S. have a diagnosed mental illness or have self-diagnosed, but about one in two. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, um, so they do, they do also talk about a difference. There's yeah. a difference in the way they're kind of processing their emotions. They may be more willing to admit when they're having um, mental symptoms. Um, but there also may be some, some genetic factors there as well. So, yeah. 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 And, and environmental. That, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. That stress can kill Absolutely. I mean, you know, the fact that chronic stress contributes to 60 to 80% of primary care doctor visits with yeah. stress conditions that are linked to hypertension, yeah. diabetes, heart disease, the mental health disorders, these are really becoming increasingly common. And that actually, um, you know, those stats and information came from the American Institute of Stress. And yes, there is an Institute of Stress. I mean, it has become that prominent. Yeah. 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 And, and left unchecked, it of course makes those mental health conditions and the physical health ones more, more likely. Yeah. Um, and yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, I, and so I wonder if this is where we start to transition into that point where we start to normalize or at least dig into the genes mm -hmm. and speak to different ways that people can perceive or might be weak towards stress. I don't mean weak, just, you know, more, more sensitive to, and, and how that can play into their experience and their resilience, right? So there's the question of how sensitive are you to stress and then how resilient are you from it after the mm. fact? Yeah. yeah, so I've already, I saw that John in the comments already has made a comment on his comp gene, namely he's saying I'm heterozygous. And so I'm pretty lucky because I fall, <laughs> I fall half. <laughs> Me too. I'm not that lucky. <laughs> oh, you're not that, you're not that lucky. <laughs> no. yeah, actually, I'm curious. I'm, I'm happy to self-disclose what my comp is. I know Dr. Varden just self-disclosed. Dilly, are, are, Dilly, are you? Yeah, I'm absolutely comfortable self-disclosing. So um, back in the day when the, the DNA when the DNA company first started, uh, we used to share our genes amongst each other, at least. <laughs> Not the client genes, just the, the staff genes amongst each yeah. other, because we were all comfortable with the clinical staff sharing genes. And something I noticed is that people's temperament is so shaped by their genes it's crazy and and dr mansoor would really emphasize this but whether yeah. you're successful with your genes or not and how you compensate for your genes is totally dependent on your environment and within your control so yes. like we saw people with just radically different personalities uh and radically different strengths and weaknesses um all like able to able to perform in different ways. So yes. there's just so much you can do with that temperament, uh, but how it is kind of from the start, things like sensitivity, like emotional sensitivity, or even chemical sensitivity, you know, those are mostly genetic. And then the outcomes are basically largely in our control. So um, in a nutshell, but comped, I unfortunately got slow comped. Okay, so, so what we, that... we have full spectrum then, because I'm a well, fast comp. Oh, you're a fast comp. I'm oh, a fast okay, comp. Okay, gotcha. Laura's a moderate comp, and then oh, you're okay. the slow. Oh, interesting. Full so, okay, yeah. And and it's interesting because, um, like, if you were to put a single word descriptor mm -hmm. on, you know, the the two extremes, so yeah. the GG, which would be the fast, is considered warrior, where mm -hmm. AA, the slow, would be considered worrier. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And yeah. it shows the most in childhood often. Uh, I don't know if you would agree with this, uh, Krista, but like that innate tendency is like often the most obvious in a kid. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> so uh, the people with slow comp do tend to be a little more OCD, uh, have a little more emotional fluctuations because basically they're not clearing those catecholamines or neurotransmitters as fast. They, their yeah. thinking can get kind of sticky. They can get kind of worried. They're not as good at transitions, um, yeah. but they can be extremely detail oriented uh, once they are on a track. So yeah, it creates pretty different tendencies. Um, yeah. The fast comps are, are often pretty good at, uh, you know, transitions and if, if they are on that hyperactive spectrum, they tend to be a little more hyperactive. So there's, there's lots of, lots of interesting differences there. Yeah. 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 So, so what Adelia kind of mentioned with what's happening in the brain. So comp, you can kind of think about it, at least in the context of our brain, like a little vacuum. And so your brain's going to pop out different things, some stress hormone, or maybe some like kind of stimulating hormone, or maybe some relaxation. And so this asks, how quickly do you suck it up? So in instances of stress, right, something horrible happens, you know, you, you get an F on a paper or someone calls you out and you're upset about it. The question is, how quickly can you clean up that stuff? So what we're saying is I clean it up pretty quickly. So I'm like, cool, I'm going to warrior on. I'm just going to move on and figure out the next step. Lara is going to be happily in between. And then Adelia, because she's marinating, because that vacuum doesn't work as quickly and she's kind of marinating in that stress, right? She's going to be a little bit more focused on it that said interestingly the opposite because there's never bad there's just different she's going to be much better at learning to a certain extent or some of that detail oriented work where I'll, I'll be the opposite at least in regards to this gene yeah. and having said that Dr. Krista is notoriously wonderful at learning but yeah <laughs> from experiences we don't know <laughs> that's where it comped me uh, yeah. play a role <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Very, very gracious of you yeah, we have a poll that we should get to take a we look and see where our people are. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. I, Michelle, you would you like to would you like to share the poll? Absolutely. Okay, so our first question: How often do you feel stressed? We have more than half of you saying frequently, Me and too. yeah, I mean, yeah, it does happen, and it's it's good that you are aware. Um, and generally, it, it is a matter of that awareness of realizing what stress feels like or what it presents as. Um, we have just over 30% of you saying occasionally and 11% uh, of you saying rarely. And no one says never. <laughs> I mean, we do live on this earth. <laughs> yeah. So uh, the audience right. is honest. I like that. Yes, I love it. <laughs> Um, and second question, if you feel stressed, do you feel confident in how you're managing it? Mm. I love that 8% said yes, very confident. I think that is fantastic. You know, and, and I'm actually, I know that a few of you have put uh, earlier in the chat, um, like Daphne says she does box breathing works best for her, mm -hmm. you know, others prayer, um, you know, others use some uh, supplements, um, mm -hmm. breath work, all of these things, these are great tools. So, you know, you're probably in there saying that you're either very confident or with the over 60% that say somewhat confident. But here we have a little over 30% of you say, no, I'm struggling to manage. And we are so glad that you are here today because we are going to be talking about techniques and things that you can do to help you, first of all, learn your genes and how you may present and experience stress because knowing that can help you learn how to manage it. So great that you are here. Um, our third question, how familiar are you with the role of genetics in your stress response and recovery? And we've got 14% being very familiar. Fantastic. So glad you're here. You know, maybe you can, um, you know, help along, you know, and help teach others about that. Uh, we've got 56% saying somewhat familiar and 31% saying not familiar at all. Again, you are going to gain a lot of information tonight. And then our fourth question, what strategies do you primarily use to manage stress? Now, this is you know, actually, because it's multiple choice, but um, we're 
all over uh, a lot of different multimodal uh, techniques. So the highest one has exercise, which is fantastic. Good job, guys. Um, Dang. Our next one is sleep and rest. Uh, our third runner up is meditation or uh, practicing mindfulness. And Good then body. there, there's an even balance between watching TV entertainment or socializing with friends and family. Yeah. And then we also have, you know, eating snack, and then maybe diving a little bit more into those other uh, habits like gambling, alcohol, um, you know, and other, if there's something other, please put it in the chat. I see that Sharon says that she does grounding outdoor time. Fantastic. Get into that Shinrin Yoku, that Japanese forest bathing, really getting into nature and can really calm the system and that nervous system. So fantastic. Oh. Thanks guys. Yeah. So thank you, Dr. Varden. I would have completely cool. skipped that just after I acknowledged <laughs> caring about the audience, it would have fluttered away. From my head. <laughs> but I wonder if we can jump back into genes that will influence how a person, uh, how our audience in particular, those who don't necessarily know how their genes influence. What is, I, I'm thinking of ADRA 2B, so at least I'm mm -hmm. setting you guys up for where I'm going. What are other genes that really influence in the moment how you're going to experience that stress. So we know that Compt gives you that kind of warrior versus warrior profile. What's something that can gauge how sensitive we're going to be to that stress? So five, I, yep, yep. <laughs> we're going to say the same thing. Five HTT LPR. So one of the main serotonin genes uh, that we test for, uh, it affects the secretion and the reuptake of serotonin. Uh, and it also affects how you might um, metabolize or respond to an SSRI. That one is a big one because it, it actually affects your amygdala if you have a suboptimal version, sometimes even making the amygdala smaller. If you have a double suboptimal, I believe it's the double S is mm -hmm. the one. Yeah. The short so, chart. Yeah. 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 Oh, okay. <laughs> Interesting. Okay. So why don't you expand on this one, Dr. Varden? If, if well, you don't. Oh, no, not at all. I yeah. mean, again, you know, like Dr. Sapp was just saying, um, it the gene influences that serotonin reuptake in the brain. You know, it directly affects mood, stress resilience. And for people like me with a double S, um, that can actually reduce the serotonin up reuptake and can be associated with increased vulnerability to stress, higher risks of depression, uh, difficulty with mood regulation, especially during or under chronic stress. But it even can take it a little bit further where it works with how you respond to incoming stimuli it can be difficult to prioritize that incoming stimuli. And that's where the overload can come. Um, I mean, I know, and I, I've talked about in other webinars, you know, like when I go to the um, airport or into a mall and when there's like noises and lights and people and, you know, all of these energies and it can just be a little overwhelming. Now I have learned techniques to be more calm, to not let it, you know, bother me. Um, and it was, it's also a matter of because you can't uh, prioritize that incoming stimuli as easily um, that you can be all over the place, you know, like squirrel. <laughs> <laughs> but again, it's that paying attention to detail, but it's using techniques um, mm -hmm. to help with focus, like having a clean workspace, making sure that the little things like checking emails or taking out the trash, that that stuff is done first before you dive into um, a project that you really need to put more focus on, things like that. Um, you know, having uh, music. I, I like classical music you know, when I'm trying to focus, that helps to calm me, you know, as I'm doing it. So these are some techniques for people with an SS. Um, but I'll tell you as a superpower, because it's not just a, you know, a bad thing as a superpower, I pay attention to detail. I catch things that most people miss, um, you know, little things I can pick up and notice immediately. And that has served me very well as a scientist. Yeah you know, for the things that I do. So, and uh, Kathleen, that gene is 5 H 
T, T is in Tom, L, P, R. It's the serotonin transporter gene. And another disclosure, I have the heterozygous suboptimal version. <laughs> um, have you noticed, uh, Dr. Varden, that a, a, a ticking clock used to be the example we used to give a mm -hmm. lot? Would that kind of drive you crazy? If it was out of curiosity. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you know, or, or someone <laughs> in school, yeah. if say there there was a kid at the desk tapping his pencil or his, you know, yeah. his, of course I say he, but you know, I'd be like, I don't know, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> rip that pen and throw it across the room. That's but, so yeah. interesting because I'm sorry, I learned well. calming techniques. <laughs> okay, okay, gotcha. Yeah, and then I'm just curious in the report because I know we used to have an algorithm. Were there specific supplements that we were still recommending for this one? I could look that up, but off the top of your head, I'm just curious. Yeah. So a lot of our supplements, like for those that are in frank deficiency of tryptophan or precursors to serotonin, there is that advice to supplement either with a 5-HTP or with a tryptophan. Um, but we tend to approach this a little bit more generally, interestingly, through the gut, because there's a huge presentation of this um, reuptake within the gut and so a lot of gut support but also in concert with the larger moon behavior picture right right that makes sense yeah yeah I remember 5-HTP being one of the ones and sometimes people's response to 5-HTP is different from SSRIs I'm not sure if that's something that you've noticed Dr. Varden that I'm sorry say that one more time I was just looking at the chat of that, uh, um, that the um that the 5-HTTLPR might make them likely to respond poorly to SSRIs, but it may they may actually respond well to 5-HTP, even though the mechanism is not entirely different? I personally have not had enough um, experience seeing how that works because not a lot of my clients are on uh, SSRIs. So, I, I mean, clinically... I, I don't have enough, you know, data. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And what I mean by ends for our audience is that mm -hmm. numbers, you know, yep. when we're talking about how many people in a population or, you know, that you're looking at, you have to have a certain threshold in order for there to be any kind of significance. So your N of one being like one person, mm -hmm. um, but we, we want many and I haven't really paid attention or notice to that specifically. Um, I did want to mention though, um, that, uh, Diane had asked, what does the LS version of the five HDT LPR mean? And basically like what Adelia has, um, it is where you lean a little more toward the SS version, more toward the inability to prioritize the incoming stimuli being more detail oriented. So, um, but not as, as much as someone like me with a double S. Yeah. So. And then there's the LLs out there who are just kind of calm and cool like a cucumber. <laughs> yeah. To an extent, there's other genes bigger, that bigger influence Bigger picture, it. not, yeah, not so much diving into the details. <laughs> So far, you're doing well, uh, Dr. Kosterman. We'll have to figure out your weak spots if you're comfortable. Oh, they're coming. They're coming. Because right. I wonder if we can talk about ADRA. Because I think yeah. of ADRA in the moment. <clears throat> excuse me, Andre in the moment is one of the bigger influencers and also something, um, Dr. Sapp, since you love talking about the brain, we'll, we'll maybe gift this to you first, something that we have a lot of strong evidence that your presentation of ADRA will influence certain elements of your brain, brain in particular that are associated with emotional memory. So uh, Dr. Sapp, Adelia, would you like to just run us through different presentations and you'll, this will find my weak point, right? <laughs> All right. Okay. And once again, there's a reason I became a mental health expert. This isn't my strongest section, but like I said, <laughs> we can compensate. There's a lot we can do. So um, yeah, so the suboptimal versions, whether it's heterozygous, so you have one suboptimal allele or homozygous, so you have two suboptimal alleles, and the two suboptimals are DD, correct? 
Cor that. Correct. And we'll, correct. we'll just be a yeah. little bit careful with our language here. So for the audience out there, we, through our reports, look a lot more at SNPs. When we're talking about SNPs, that we're talking about alleles. In this, we're talking about insertions and deletions. So we're really talking about how much information is there. And we, and I'm included in this, sometimes we get a little bit lazy with our language and we'll still refer to it. Oh, girl, all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the queen of getting lazy with my language. And I'm so grateful for Dr. Barton because every once in a while she'll be like, you rounded too much there. <laughs> it's her SS. It's SS. SS. Yeah. yeah, makes sense. Yeah, and I'm, my LL is very grateful for it. Right. Um, so we're for this one at least, because this is really important, right? We take a step beyond just a SNP, so beyond just those num or letter presentations to say how much information is there, because the amount of information when it comes to ADRA will influence how you're going to experience noradrenaline. And this is right. where I'll pass the mic back. Yeah. Right. So the DD version um, or the deletion uh, would be associated with decreased desensitization of noradrenergic receptors. So what that means is essentially noradrenaline um, in your synapse is going to um, sit there a little bit longer or have a more pronounced effect. Yeah. Um, so that can lead to an increased memory of negative events it can make you more likely to experience PTSD. Um, and what we're learning more now that our culture is becoming somewhat more trauma informed is that trauma is not just about the event that occurred, it's about how you process it, how it affects your brain, how it affects your physiology. Um, yeah. So those with the suboptimal variation um, are more likely to be affected by these negative events and have an increased stress response. So this is a big gene for stress, uh, most definitely. Okay. Uh, things like EMDR um, or EFT tapping uh, or trauma-informed therapies can be really helpful for this group, particularly if they have experienced any kind of trauma. So, yeah. yeah. And like that, those one word descriptors. So someone with a DD, a double deletion would be considered more of like empath versus an in, in insertion II, which I happen to be, is stoic. So, yeah. you know, you can really, you know, work off of that. Um, but it doesn't mean that that uh, title pigeonholes you or anything, because again, this is just one gene in the whole constellation that we have in the mood and behavior profiles. Remember that these genes do not exist in a vacuum. They work as a team. So, yeah. you know, but we, we are just focusing in on one player on that team when we are talking about this, but then we have to zoom out when we are looking at the person and we look at all of the genes and how they play yeah. together. Right. Yes. And and the easiest example, right, would be comped because if someone has the deletion for the ADRA 2B and they also have slow comped, um, that would interact and create even more of a, a stress response in, in that mm -hmm. individual. So you, you kind of have to interface a lot of the cognitive genes with comped because um, mm -hmm. it can uh, affect their metabolism and, and affect them as well. So, yeah, the whole picture, right? Yeah. 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 But if we were, I guess, to look at ADRA in a vacuum, i.e. Mm -hmm. no other influence, those with the, the insertion, so Dr. Varden here, <laughs> the blessed amongst us in this instance, right? She's going to experience that st stress and not necessarily be as impacted by it. So be able to operate a little bit more log logically, for lack of better phrasing, not being as overwhelmed and kind of panicked by it compared to, I think, Adelia, you said you were a double D? Uh, no, I was a heterozygous D. So, okay. still so we're both optimal ideas. in the yeah. Yeah, uh, other okay. report. But as Dr. Varden mentioned, all of these variations, you know, whether we're calling it suboptimal or not, they all have like positive aspects as yeah. well. The people with the more suboptimal versions tend to have increased sensitivity, including to the emotions of others. So, yeah. you know. Yeah. yeah, they can generally read a room better, you know, yeah. or be able to feel someone else's uh, emotional state, be able to read that better. So, yeah, but it, again, not fatalistic, because I look at Dr. Varden, incredibly empathic, incredibly sensitive. 
and yet she does not present um, genetically as you would expect in this in that one way. Yeah. All right. So I think why don't we address maybe one more gene? Um, I'm thinking BDNF. Kind of before we oh, <laughs> oh <God. laughs> I, I love it on that one. Um, before we jump into some Q and A, as well as really focusing on what do we do about this? So we know our profile, we're able to normalize this a little bit. You know, what are some techniques? Cause I love Adelia in particular for the last one that you really mentioned like um, emotional freedom tapping or other sorts of things. So we can really say like, you know, if you know you're suboptimal in this way, here's something you might want to consider, but yeah. let's jump into BDNF and why we're going from Andra to BDNF. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And just as a note on EFT tapping, part of why I bring it up is because I've found that with the majority of my patients, especially those with uh, trauma, it's been really helpful. It was actually created for dealing with trauma. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a combination of modern psychotherapy and Asian medicine, which you wouldn't think would combine that well, but it turns out they do. And it's been well studied and it lowers cortisol, the main stress hormone. So I think mm -hmm. it's really relevant. Um to the conversation. Um, but yeah, BDNF is fascinating. Um, it's uh, It has a really big effect on the repair of the brain. So especially for people who've, ha who've played contact sports. So uh, I think kids should get tested for this one, especially in America, especially if they're male and planning on playing football. But anyway, that's just uh, hopefully, hopefully that's okay to say. <laughs> um, but any kind of brain injury, um, it takes the brain longer um, to repair. If you have a suboptimal version and Krista, you might be able to speak to whether um, what the alleles are for this one. Um, yeah. So um, the heterozygous suboptimal and the double suboptimal, unless you're Correct. not referring. Okay. Um, so for, so this, if you're, for, for clarity, if you're an yeah. AA or an AG, you're considered suboptimal for this. Okay. And then the GG is optimal. Yeah, go ahead. So, yeah, so they would be associated with increased neuroticism. Um, they would be associated with a longer um, period of time in order for the brain to repair from physical trauma or emotional trauma. Um, so this one's really impactful. I did find that in prior samples, there were less people with this suboptimal than there were some of the other variations. Um, I don't know what that's looking like now. Um, but some of the ways, because we could all use more BDNF essentially, regardless of our uh, genetic predispositions, especially mm -hmm. since we're all being stressed out and our... <laughs> Brains are often getting damage of different kinds. Um, full disclosure, I did work with Amen Clinics for a while. So I looked at a lot of brain scans and all kinds of assaults are happening to the brain. So increasing BDNF means increasing repair um, mm -hmm. to the brain. So one thing that really has been shown to help in the research is infrared sauna. Uh, another is sunshine. So just getting sunlight exposure, um, especially in the morning, has been shown to increase BDNF um, and then cardiovascular exercise, as well as some of the supplements like green coffee, fruit extract. Those are just some of like the main recommendations that come to mind for that one. And Dr. Kosterman did a fantastic solo webinar nice. speaking about BDNF <laughs> a couple weeks back. So, you know, we always, uh, you know, offer, go watch that, um, that webinar, that video on YouTube. It's, it's wonderful. And she really dives deep into BDNF. So. Awesome. Thanks. Yeah. And just, and honestly making the case, cause I think this is really important. Like you, even if you have a perfect profile here, come mid twenties, you're no longer optimally making it. Cause as, as Adelia just said, it's this miracle grow. It's this thing that helps your brain repair and learn. And the body has decided that once you hit your mid twenties, <laughs> you don't need to be focusing as much energy and effort on that. You're focusing energy and effort on other things. And so you stop making it. So even if you have the perfect profile to Adelia's point, to, to Lara's point, we're all crazy stress by many different things are when when Adelia said assault she's not talking about someone literally bumping you in the head that might be it but you know that assault of stress 
that assault of not eating well, that assault of, 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 that will impact your brain. And so the things that she just said that you can do to support it or might be in the webinar, more or less the same thing, um, right? All of these go to the end of not only stress resilience, but brain health. And we know the brain over time. And Laura, Dill, you could probably speak better to this than I can. Over time, chronic stress will quite literally atrophy or shrink the brain, right? We know that something that we think is woo-woo and intangible stress will quite literally have a biologic impact that impairs your brain alongside the rest of your body. So regardless your profile here, it's so advised to be doing things to support your BDNF because it helps your overall stress resilience. Yeah. yeah. And you also have to consider the cumulative effects, you know, uh, like you were saying, you know, as kids, you know, when we're jumping around, hitting our heads, especially if you played sports, I played a lot of sports and it's not just football where you can get a traumatic brain injury or I mean um I I was in track <laughs> doing the high jump and I land on the edge of the the mat there and I fell up hit, hit my head I did that a few times <laughs> you know oh. figure skating you know practicing some of the jumps and spins and you hit you know miss it and slam into the ice hit my head. I mean, I'm surprised my brain still works sometimes with how many times I've hit my head. But I mean, like in hockey, my grandson is incredible hockey player, but man, he has slid and hit his head in the boards. And I'm just like, oh, your little brain. So you, know, you consider that, especially if it's multiple times and even soccer, you think, oh, but you're kicking the ball. Well, you also head the ball. And yeah. that can actually, you know, uh, cause a jarring enough effect to make your brain shake in your skull. Um, but yeah. also consider if you've been in a car accident, which again, I've been in a car accident, got rear-ended, um, you know, anything where you have that physical injury, but then also with really traumatic stresses, uh, experiences, traumas, um, yeah you know, you are talking about that allostatic load, you know, these stresses that tend to build and that can just exacerbate um, any presentations or the way that you respond to uh, stressful situations and your nervous system just gets overstimulated. It's just wired to a point. And this is one of the reasons why exercise is so helpful because you're burning off that excess energy nerves and also with tapping and, you know, uh, EMDR and, and these other things, you are allowing the, the energy from the nerves to be dissipated and to relax that. So, but it's an ongoing technique that it's not like, oh, once I got it mastered, I'm fine. Well, no, it's, <laughs> it's a journey, yeah. not a destination. Yeah. It's a journey. And the great thing is once you take care of, let's say you're someone in the audience that has, or you identify that you have a lot of mental stress, once you start implementing things to lower that, um, if we're talking especially about a lot of lifestyle agents, um, or dietary changes or exercise or supplements, they tend to help your whole body. And they also tend to help with disease uh, prevention. So I don't know if either of you have read Outlive by Peter Atia. Yes, yeah. I do. And he really addresses that, you know, yes. he talks about the fact that, you know, repressed stress, trauma, any kind of like emotional stress behind the scenes is going to affect your longevity. So he makes it very concrete in that we all kind of need to address it if we're yeah. thinking long term. <laughs> and I really appreciated the vulnerability yeah. and the candor he used about his personal journey. And I mean, the real depths he went into, I mean, here he is, you know, a, a very prominent figure in this field of a brilliant doctor does doing wonderful things, but even he has dealt with, you know, the mental struggles and how that impacted his family life, you know, his work life, everything else. Um, but one of the main things that, you know, I really took away from that is having that support system. And we mentioned this earlier that, you know, having the people there, who can you call, you know, what doctors, what friends, family do you have 
when you are struggling and you need help, you know, two o'clock in the morning, who can you call? Who's going to pick up that phone and, and be there for you? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Would, yeah. Sorry. I would also offer it. I, I think it's very important to have that person that you call in a bind, but I would also offer it's just as important to have that person that you call and you can download a day onto. Cause I think there's beautiful medicine, especially in stress. One of the, one of the coolest things I've seen in doing our gene work is when I tell a person about their genes and they're like, Oh, cool. That's why I do that. There's an element of normalization and I find conversations between people will also help that, right? You call a friend and you're like, Oh, I was at work and I got really stressed and I got, you know, I had to go poop and it was really embarrassing because I had to go poop, but I was really Natural past love talking about this for the record. <laughs> but if, it's but one of our favorite comments. Chip in. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. I was literally just at a poop conference. So yes, go on. <laughs> yeah. No, but no, I, I bring this up because like not a lot of people like talking about poop, myself included, even though I'm a naturopath, I really don't like it. It's, it's kind of ick, just don't. But if you were to call your friend, if I was to call up Adelia or Lara and say, yo, I had a really bad day. And all of a sudden I just got the sudden urge to poop. Their first reaction, even before the doctor reaction would be like, oh girl, me too. I've had that happen before. Right. Yeah. And that normalization takes some of that stress away. Right. Yeah. There is, there's quite literally that loading of like, oh, it's not only me right? That communication, there's medicine in that conversation. And then they would follow up with, that's a very natural physiologic response to stress. So don't worry, poop is part of it. And then I'd be like, let's stop talking about poop. Especially if they were a clinician, <laughs> they would, yeah, give you the whole breakdown of the mechanism, potentially. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, mon dieu. All right. So, so we can avoid some more poop talk. Let's jump into some of the questions in the chat. And then maybe after that, because I don't see many, um, maybe after that, we talk a little bit more about different stress relief techniques that we have, because I, I love that you're kind of bringing up, um, I wouldn't call them fringe, but not necessarily techniques that everyone per se has heard of. So mm -hmm. maybe we elaborate on what those techniques are so that yeah. people, if they're interested in them, can kind of explore them for themselves. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so the first question we have here is from Kathleen, and she's curious about the NTHFR gene and stress. All right, so 10 bucks to the first person that calls it by the popular name, but who would like to address this question? <laughs> I can. Please, please, please. Okay, so MTHFR, yes, the motherfucker gene. There we go. It's <laughs> 10, 10 Canadian dollars, though. 10 Canadian okay. dollars. <laughs> so, this gene actually does play a very crucial role in the methylation process, obviously. This impacts neurotransmitter balance, mood overall stress response. So how does that do that? Okay. So when we're talking about variants in MTHFR gene, this can lead to like reduced enzymatic efficiency, particularly with common variants. Um, actually we, we cover two, um, in our reports and when the variants, um, if, if it has a lower ability to convert, uh, folate into its active form, five MTHFR, there we go. MTHF, there we go, uh, which is essentially for producing and regulating neurotransmitters like serotonin, dopamine, norepinephrine. Um, each of these influence mood stability and resilience to that stress. So, you know, understanding where you lie in your methylation pathway you can do things to help support it, um, you know, and there are ways, and actually COMPT, COMPT is part of the methylation mm -hmm. pathway. It is that last player. It is yeah. the player that puts the methyl group onto the substrate, whether it is the neurotransmitter or a toxin or, you know, that uh, estrogen metabolite, for example. So, you know, if your COMPT is slow, okay, there are ways to help support the methylation pathway to help regulate things more efficiently. And this is where your B vitamins come in, you know, making sure you have zinc and magnesium and, and having that nice, um, you know, diet exercise, making sure you're getting your sleep, managing these lifestyle factors. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. I just have to say, I'm so glad someone brought up MTHFR because methylation yeah. 
is a hill I'm willing to die on because I see <laughs> errors all the time yes. where people think that upping their methylation, like their methylated B vitamins is going to fix their anxiety and it doesn't it makes it work worse. that way. It, it, it sometimes makes yeah. it worse. So if you have any kind of, especially anxiety or like you're prone to migraines or agitation or what brain fog, what are some other common over methylating symptoms, Krista? Those are the first ones. No, I, I think that's the main one. Anxiety. Yeah. Some people will present in their skin in the sense of mm -hmm. like a little bit of heat, they'll suddenly flush. Right. Um, but I think that like the agitation tends to be the biggest one I see. Yeah. But right. it doesn't mean that everyone, if you take methylated forms of say it full mm -hmm. melanin, it, it means that your anxiety will increase. No, this is where the other genes come in. Your yes, SHMT1, we have to look at that to see what form of folate B9 that you need. You know, we need to look at MTR to see which form of cobalamin B12 that you need. So all of these play a factor. But, Absolutely. Yeah. I yeah. think my point was really that if you are considering B vitamins, um, and if you have a tendency towards anxiety, and if you have some suboptimal methylation genes, you just want to pay attention to the details within that section um, and talk to a consultant or a clinician who can advise you on the best forms of those vitamins because some people will respond better to the pre-methylated yes. ones and others will respond better to the hypoallergenic or non-methylated ones and then you also want to look at the combination so yeah 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 in our report, <laughs> we, do, we do a decent job of kind of saying okay here are the ones that are associated with folate here are the ones that are associated with cobalamin or b12 right and how that interplays with your comp right i think the the pitfall that that Dr. Hart and Dr. Sapp have really elegantly spoken to is methylation is a team sport. There's a lot of different genes or enzymes involved. And if you're only looking at one player on the field, you don't know what's actually happening in the game. You know if that one player has the ball or not, but you don't know if they've passed it and if they have passed it, who has it. So you need to know about all your players and then support your players appropriately, right? Some if you have one weak player, you need to support them. You don't necessarily need to support another. So that's what they very elegantly said. And, and I would also, I'm going to take it one step further, Dr. Sapp. I see because MTHFR is such a trendy gene, right? People only look at that player. They yeah. only look at LeBron James or whoever else, insert sport, sports person. Um, they're only looking at that one person. They're like, cool, I better take all these methyl full, like methyl folate. I better take all these methyl B vitamins separately to that. A lot of supplement companies are like, oh, methyl folate's really fancy. Even though our supplement has nothing to do with methylation, we're going to put it in there because of course we are. Yes. And I have seen people come in when they recount the number of supplements that they're on. Mm -hmm. They're on excessive, like six times a daily recommended dose simply because they're taking two or three products yeah. that all happen to have methylfolate in it yeah but the interaction you, mm -hmm. yeah I'd, I'd really encourage like work with your clinician there's going to be that random person who maybe needs five times the amount but I yeah. promise that's very very rare work mm -hmm. with your clinician and if you're creating your own <laughs> supplement stack look at the amount of b vitamins in it because I promise if you have more than two or three products you're probably overdoing it that's, that's my hill that I will die right. on. <laughs> right. Supplements is a very fine and delicate art and science. Uh, it's similar to pharmacology, um, mm. but it takes a special kind of consultant or practitioner um, to give you good information on it. So, yeah. And if yeah. I, if, if I may be so bold, I'm going to brag on doc, uh, Dr. Sapp's behalf. Dr. Sapp is our director of Black Label. So here at the DNA company, we invest a lot of energy thought and science behind the supplementing that we do and in particular that nuance how do you create an individual kind of consideration for a person and she is our she and uh, dr wild are the resident experts on that so she won't brag but i'm very happy to brag on her behalf <laughs> appreciate it krista i do love my supplements that i will say <laughs> that is also true <laughs> Big that is, of quality yeah, that's <laughs> I've seen your yeah. stack. You do love your supplements. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. We have another question from Deborah. 
Um, so Deborah's asking, uh, how powerful is the effect of a moderate? So this is a heterozygous or an AG compt over a slow mouse. So we haven't talked about mouse. We'll have to address that. Um, for clearing catecholamine neural neurotransmitters and managing stress reactions. So um, Dr. Varden, Dr. Sapp, why don't we first explain MAO before we jump into kind of this combinatorics question? Dr. Varden, do well, you want to start? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So, okay, MAO, this is, this stands for monoamine oxidase. It's a gene that's involved in the breakdown of neurotransmitters, including serotonin, dopamine, norepinephrine, and uh, the variance. Okay. So slow activity results in prolonged neurotransmitter presence, and that can lead to increased sensitivity to stress, heightened emotional responses. Again, very similar as you may sound as comped, um, where uh, for reduced MAO activity, this can be beneficial for mood, motivation at low stress levels, but under chronic stress, it can really increase anxiety, impulsivity, mood swings, things like that. So where like a fast MAO, the opposite of that, um, that can actually lead to a rapid breakdown of those neurotransmitters, and that can reduce resilience leading to depressive symptoms. And uh, I like my, my little individual word descriptors. So um, it would be the difference between like a tempest for someone with a GG presentation, um, which is the fast, or a tranquil, which would be the TT for the slow clearance. So that's kind of a little in a nutshell. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. Apparently the faster ones associated with lower empathy as well, but uh, I don't know. Mansoor was uh, highlighting that. I'm not sure if it's in the current report. <laughs> interesting. But yeah, it's an interesting gene. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. But what's, and, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh no. Well, I was going to say, so, so Deborah is really asking these, both these enzymes kind of touch in the brain. They're both vacuums in the brain. And how do we balance them out? And uh, there's an element of like, I think Adelia, hold me honest here. Compt, we said is the primary actor you're going to kind yeah. of take most credence from Compt yeah with with Mao kind of being your very Im like important but a supportive actor right I would not, say a secondary yeah. yeah yeah agreed yeah well it's also a matter of where they work in the brain because mm -hmm. Compt That's primarily true. works in the prefrontal cortex that you know decision making the executive uh mm -hmm. decision and emotional regulation so where MAO um that oh, well, obviously also breaks down the catecholamines but across a broader uh broader brain regions and it's slower in clearing serotonin and norepinephrine dopamine so that's know, a good yeah. distinction yeah yeah that that I yeah I'm pretty sure you're you're right about that. I'm sure you are. <laughs> good different, uh, good yeah. distinction. Mm -hmm. So Deborah, what you're hearing is it depends a little bit. They're both important, but you're also never going to get crystal clear math on that one. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I'm seeing some more questions in here. Uh, Tanya is asking, what is the maximum amount of supplements a person should take a day? Can you take supplements for years? such as a multivitamin or a probiotic? Oh God, I should probably get into this one. <laughs> <laughs> we, another one don't. of those topics, a rabbit hole. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so simply put, it all depends on the supplements that you are taking. So, uh, you know, there's some fat soluble supplements that you do sometimes have to be careful with like the A, D, E, and K. Um, if you are, you know, taking vitamin D, especially larger doses for long periods of time, just to ensure you're not one of those minority of people that gets high vitamin D, you want to get your blood levels checked. Um, and then you don't want to take exorbitant levels of vitamin A for long periods of time because that can cause liver toxicity. It's a fat soluble vitamin that gets stored in the liver. But if you are taking quality supplements that aren't, um, you know, any of the supplements with cautions and you're being overseen by a consultant or a clinician, ideally, sometimes you can actually take quite a few and it's totally cool. But it all depends on the quality. Uh, your individual biology, um, and which supplements and dose we're talking about, if that isn't too many factors. 
I think I think a really important question to ask when you start taking a supplement, either you choose it or a clinician uh, gives it to you, is the why and how long. Mm. I once saw someone, this was when I was in my training, a fellow came in, he had been on zinc for 50 years because he had a minor deficiency and the person never told him to stop. Right. And so he was coming in for some actual consequences of that, but it was because he didn't think to stop. He started it and didn't stop. Right. So always right. ask the question, when do I need to stop? Because some, I think to Dr. Sapp's point are reasonable to be taking forever more. But if you go in with a clinical need, he had a problem. He had low zinc at the time he needed it. The question is how long, when are you retesting? When are you figuring out if it needs to stay in or come out? And that's really the guidance, the care and the support, the TLC that a clinician yeah. can offer. And I think a lot of people, especially in environmental medicine, so that's looking at like toxins in the environment and stuff. And I know Dr. Barton, you have a specialty in this. Uh, is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Talk about pulsing, right? Um, exactly. You talk yeah. about cycling uh, between yeah. different supplements um, yes. and that can increase the efficacy because somewhat like a drug and it all depends on the individual supplement, you can sometimes build a tolerance and you know, it has different effects short term and long term. So, yeah. or they can. And multis, I will say, the devil's in the details. Some are good, some not so much. So, yeah. 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 And yeah. it's also good periodically to know is this still working for me? Because our, our bodies are changing. You know, our needs are changing, our environment is changing. So, you know, I will take periodic uh, supplement vacations where mm. I'll just stop. How do mm. I feel? Well, usually <laughs> there's, there's some negative things. I'm like, Oh, okay. Well, there are some things that I did need. And then I'll just reintroduce the ones. Well, cause I know my body, I know what each does, you know, and then I'll start feeling better, but some I don't need to take anymore or, you know, that I'm just like, okay, I don't need to take this right now. And where, if I start feeling it, and then I'll reintroduce it for a short period of time, but this is where the testing, this is where, you know, working with someone and also knowing why, why mm -hmm. are you taking it? What is it doing? Because I bet if that gentleman had known, okay, you're taking zinc, you're, you're deficient in this. And these are the presentations that you're having that, you know, are related to low zinc. Um, so this is what you're looking for. Then he, instead of just kind of mindlessly in a way, and I, and, and I, I don't want to, you know, downplay him, you know, as a person or thought processes, it's just, sometimes we're like, oh, okay, I'll just take it. And then you just Absolutely. keep taking it. But if he Absolutely. had, gone, okay, this is what we're doing it for. This is what you should notice would be different you know, informing that person, then they could make that decision going, oh, okay, I feel better now. I'm not having this. Therefore, you know, yeah. should I stop and then have more advocacy in yeah. the things that they are doing in their own health? Yeah. And I will Definitely. say that like, oh, sorry. Go no, on. no, go ahead. Go ahead. Now, when it comes to like the politics of supplements, I, I won't get too much into it, but in mm -hmm. the US, they're not all regulated. So that is something to just well, they're basically largely unregulated. They are somewhat regulated by the FTA. Um, but that does mean that you do have to be a little bit extra uh, careful about the quality of the supplements uh, that you're taking um, and that you have to kind of consult uh, with the right people if you have any concerns. Um, so, yeah. yeah. Some pharmacists are, are starting to become more knowledgeable on the whole Mm -hmm. from what I've seen they haven't been the best resources but they do have some of the most kind of important cautions and interactions um so they could be like a first stop and then you know consulting with someone in the natural health field uh, is another stop <laughs> I find I find that's a lot of <clears throat> um how deep that pharmacist wants to go so for example we have dr stephanie nielsen on our team who's a farm d meaning she's a doctor of pharmacy and so she's done a done pharmacy training such that she works at pharmacies and she dispenses medications and consults with clients around their medications 
but she's also very passionate around nutrition and around supplementation. So she has taken it unto herself to do that additional training. So I think there's an element like not all MDs are created equal, not all NDs are created equal, not all PhDs are created equal because we all have different interests. It's an element of where have they done additional training. So it's yeah, that's something to be thinking about. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Sharon has a question that kind of runs along this vein. Um, so Sharon's asking, she wants to dive deeper into understanding her report. I imagine she's referring to the DNA 360. Sharon, let us know if I'm not imagining correctly. Um, what resources are available? So I'll offer, there's, there's two depending on what you're, you're seeking to do. So first and foremost, if you're looking to understand your DNA report in the context of your health, your health goals, you can engage with us. You, we have a team, including Dr. Hart and Dr. Sapp, of practitioners that are very well trained in what these genes mean and separate to that, how they relate to a health picture and how you kind of enliven the two. So we have programs, we have consults, et cetera, et cetera. Um, if you're, a, if you're a four eyes like us and you're kind of asking to the end of, hey, I actually just want to dive into the academics of it. We do have a space that uh, Dr. Varden is dean of, um, DNAU, and this is somewhere that you can go as well if you're interested to kind of do the deeper dives where we will sit and we'll say, okay, for ADRA, we're going to go through some of this biochemistry. We're going to go through what does it mean? How does this enliven, right? You'll get the biochemistry from Dr. Mansour, and then from myself and colleagues, you'll get kind of more the clinical presentation and how do you play with it? How does it present? Um, so depending on what you're seeking to do, Dr. Varden, anything to add to that since you're our, you're our infamous dean there? Uh, just that we have expanded our services um, and we also have a uh, wonderful Dr. Krista who actually walks through several of the tests that we offer, you know, mm -hmm. so you can actually learn more about the other testing services that we have um, that really round out uh, a larger picture uh, with the DNA as the foundation to be able to help, you know, your clients, patients, or just if you want to learn more about you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. And we are going to be having, um, you know, Q and A's, live Q and A's um, on a regular basis. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll be holding office hours. So it's going to be very open, very interactive, and uh, just a lot of fun, amazing information. Mm -hmm. Yeah, awesome. Sweet. Okay. Um, I hope I'm saying this right. Alessia, Alessia. Alyssa. Alyssa, merci beaucoup. Okay, um, <laughs> this is a wonderful question that I already know you two are going to find very tasty. Um, can we cover? Um, can we cover awareness? The, sorry, can we? Oh dear, I'm going to get it. Okay, can we cover the awareness and how we create our own stressors in our daily lives based on how we walk away from interactions with friends, family, strangers? So acknowledging how our various patterns and pleasure seeking behaviors can contribute to our own stress because um, we're upset about how someone conducted themselves <clears throat> and then holding on to an emotion that doesn't serve you, um, letting go. So um, and how you kind of create empathy for others. So I kind of like this because I think this is a beautiful question that kind of rounds out everything that we've been speaking about really to that what are what are genes or what are things that can play into and, and we're going to speak very specific um at least said to to genes because i think there's an element of sociology and there's an element of psychology and a lot of other things and we plainly don't have time to kind of you know I, I think we'd be here into infinity and beyond if we tried to do that but we'll speak to the genes kind of offer that quick summary as to what will influence some of how you receive that engagement and then what will influence kind of how you can be resilient to that. I hope that's fair. Um, yeah, because I think we could we could go down a delightful little rabbit hole of all the different um, branches to this wonderful little tree. Um, yeah. Dr. Adelia, Dr. Dr. Lara, who would like to take the first bite of this? I do really <laughs> like this question. <laughs> we... I really like this question. Alyssa, is that yes. correct? Okay, Alyssa, because it perfectly ties together the biological, the psychological, and the sociological. 
So in terms of that biopsychosocial model that affects our stress response, some of it can tie into some of the genes we talked about. Like, let's say you had slower comp, you might be more likely to hold on um, to certain interactions. If you had um, the deletion of adr 2 b or the heterozygous version of adr 2 b you could also have an increased stress, stress response from those interactions. Um, if you had one of the suboptimal versions of BDNF, that could also increase your response to those interactions. If you had the SS5-HTTLPR, is that correct, Dr. Barden, the one you were referencing? Yeah. yeah. Sometimes the allele uh, letters, I, yeah, went <laughs> for a second. But um, for that one also, um, it could lead to, to increased irritability or just like noticing um, things in the environment that kind of throw you off. So basically a lot of your genes can affect your initial response in terms of your temperament. But then in terms of your... Uh, patterns, that's where the psychology comes in. And certain strategies or techniques like cognitive behavioral therapy or dialectical behavioral therapy, or if you have trauma, EMDR or tapping uh, or different somatic therapies, those can all help to rewire um, the psychology. Um, and then, of course, it also ties in the sociology, because let's say you're in a really stressful environment day in and day out at work or at home, or you have extreme socioeconomic stress, those would all play into yeah. the mix. Um, yeah. Yeah. But um, you can address it from multiple angles, but some of the psychological techniques um, sound like they'd be more appropriate in this case. And of course, you'd have to consult with a psychologist uh, or a clinician about that yeah. but uh, yeah don't know yeah. if you guys have anything else to add no I like that um oh uh, I, I just briefly I like that you kind of offered the somatic idea so somatic she's really referring to body and so if several people in the chat have kind of dropped in Gabor Monte are, are various other people who have kind of spoken to the idea of how stress can live and then be imprinted within the body. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's this beautiful breaking off of an idea that's not just mind work because we tried that for a really long time and it wasn't, it helped, but it wasn't the complete picture. And so it's also looking at other modalities to release some of this from the body. Dr. Varden, I saw you're, 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 you're ready to take a bite as well. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And this is getting into offering solutions when it comes to educating yourself more about where traumas come from, how they can manifest, um, and as well as giving you tools for how to deal with these things. Um, you know, uh, actually a few books in particular, The Body Keeps the Score uh, by Dr. Bessel van der Kolk. Mm -hmm. And actually I had seen in the um, in the chat that uh, Echo Lee actually had mentioned that mm -hmm. wonderful book um, that really talks about, you know, where it can come from, how traumas, you know, can manifest physically as well as using many different techniques, actually several that Adelia already mentioned, um, you know, uh, that you can go through to help. Uh, another book, The Tools um, by doctors uh, Phil Stutz and Barry Michaels. And really this book is, is just incredible. Um, it helps to overcome insecurities, addiction, loss, challenges, um, you know, walking you through techniques that he uses with his clients. And actually there was a, um, a, a movie documentary, Jonah Hill um, directed because uh, Phil Stutz is his oh. therapist and it's called Stutz. It was on Netflix yep. like a, a year and a half ago or something. Uh, fantastic. Uh, and it really gets into you know, the mental health aspect and then understanding, you know, again, taking that amorphic stress and traumas and putting it into something tangible, really actionable things that you can do to work through this. Um, another one, Arate. Uh, it's by Brian Johnson and it is, you know, 451 
things to live your life in excellence, you know, the best that you can from moment to moment, very practical things, absolutely fantastic book. And then you know, there was another one that I saw in the chat, someone, um, Mind as Healer, Mind as Slayer by Kenneth Pelletier. And uh, apparently Marianne um, had mentioned this. She said it's one of the first books she studied as a clinical psychologist in grad school, very informative even today. So, you know, if you lean into being more of like, give me information, let me learn more, you know, these are definitely books that can, um, that can help with that. That's awesome. Um, Dr. Rodin, are you able to pop those in the chat? I didn't uh, get the comment. Oh, I, yeah. Okay. Beautiful. Let, and as okay. she's doing that, we can move on to our next question. And this is from uh, Tanya again. Uh, so can you talk more um, in, in terms of pros and cons about neck and then separately also about ashwagandha and how that can help stress in the brain. Um, she offers the statement ashwagandha is a supplement that a lot of women seem to really like. And I would also offer men love it. It's it's really, really well studied in, in sports. Um, and that's uh, male sports gets a lot of money for this sort of thing. So it's not to say it's not helpful for female sports. It's just that traditionally that's where the money sat. Um, Adelia, would you like to to tackle this? Yeah, sure. Um, to start, um, NAC has so many different applications in mental health. Um, and two of yeah, I love it too. <laughs> Take it every night. Anyways, so, um... so for everyone's awareness, <laughs> yeah. NAC is N-acetylcysteine. It's an amino acid. And sorry, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, so it it can be really good for your immune system. It can be really good for your de uh, your detox. Um, in the general sense. Um, people can take it at different times of day. There are a few medications that it does interact with. So you want to be careful about interactions. Um, taking it at night sometimes works for people because you do tend to detox better at night while you're resting. You want to clean out your brain too at night. Um, in higher doses, it can be used for OCD. Um, it can also be used um, in the context of addiction. Um, and it also just generally tends to be a bit of a neurotransmitter tonic in a general sense. Uh, and it can lower anxiety as well. So lots of applications for neck. Also, if you have like nasal congestion or any respiratory stuff going on at the same time. And the great thing about some of these more natural agents is you can get multiple effects at once. Um, it's also a mucolytic, so it helps to clear out some of the nasal congestion or mucus or stuff like that at the same time. So that's a little bit on NAC. Mm -hmm. um, ashwagandha, some people respond better than others, um, and it does have mm -hmm. a bit of a hormonal uh, effect. Uh, mm -hmm. Krista, would you say that increasing testosterone is a common effect of ashwagandha by a little small margin, or is that just mm -hmm. kind of like... Depends on, the, depends on the study. Mm -hmm. And then I think I would also offer probably the reason we're seeing such variance in research there is um, studies aren't often considering of genomic profiles and how a person would naturally, right? So usually when people are recruited for a study, especially if it's something that's more controlled, yeah. up until recently, their genetic profile would not be considered. And mm -hmm. so you're going to get people who are very prone towards creating greater amounts of testosterone compared to those that are not. And right. that, that I would offer is kind of why you see some of the studies being wish-washy about this. So I think that's something that with your clinician, you'd want to, because it can, in some people, increase. And we yeah. know for certain females, especially if you have PCOS or other conditions that you don't want your testosterone going up, got to be very careful about that. Okay, so right. yeah, yeah. But I'll, I'll yeah. allow you to kind of talk as to what ashwagandha is and then... Yeah. Yeah. So it's a root, it's called an adaptogen. So that's a term that we like to use in a uh, naturopathic medicine. We love adaptogens. They're basically agents that help modulate your stress response. So it sounds crazy, but there's certain things that can like 
improve your stress response, like even elevate it to the point if you're really burnt out, you might need a little bit of a stress response, or they can lower your stress. So ashwagandha is one of those agents that helps improve your stress response, potentially your immune system at the same time can have an effect hormonally, people respond a little bit differently to it. But there's so many options when it comes to adaptogens too that you might want to consider. Like some people respond really well to holy basil, other people to licorice, other people to shizandra. They all have slightly mm -hmm. different properties, but there's a lot uh, of different ones out there. Um, I don't know if you had anything else to add to that. Oh, I, I actually Perverted. wanted to add, I mean, you know, here we're talking about, um, you know, different herbs and adaptogens, but I don't want to forget about mushrooms, mm. you know, as adaptogens. So, I mean, yes. as, especially like things like reishi from uh, yeah. Ganoderma, and this it's often called the mushroom of immortality, but mm -hmm. it has adaptogenic properties that can help oh. calm the nervous system, reduce anxiety and promote that relaxation. I mean, there's also lion's mane, um, mm -hmm. you know, known mm -hmm. for its cognitive benefits. Um, it actually, it helps to promote nerve growth factor, um, which is essential for brain health. And then we're looking at cordyceps, that's energizing, supports adrenal function, you know, really helps for physical stress and fatigue. Um, chaga, I actually forage for ta chaga myself. I love it. Um, very nice. rich antioxidants, you know, that can help um, with, uh, you know, elevated chronic stress because it helps to support the immune system. And, you know, can't forget about maitake, their shiitake, but like maitake, it helps with immune regulating properties, you know, Anytime that you can help to buffer the immune system's response to stress, that can actually help with suppressing cortisol levels if they're too high. So, you know, I, I've really gotten into the mushrooms <laughs> lately, like in the last, I would say, six to eight months. And, you know, I take them, I have them in my coffee, I have tinctures, you know, because there's a local, you know, grower here in this <laughs> state that I go to the farmer's market and go get it. Absolutely fantastic. I, I love the medicinal mushrooms. The second mm -hmm. one. Absolutely. <laughs> so many good ones in there. And they're great with coffee, I have to say. In terms of getting coffee jitters, the, if there's reishi in there or like a couple of those other adaptogens, sometimes it can completely change the response. If you're one of those people that gets the jitters from coffee. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I love that we just nerded out on plants. Um, <laughs> <laughs> back a little bit to the question. I think it was it, like ashwagandha became this rabbit hole that we divided yeah. off and it's this concept yeah. of adaptogens so that if you're stressed, really what I've heard here is there's a beautiful, great big toolbox that is our earth that can support different ways of modulating your stress. So I think to, you know, Dr. Sapp's point, if you've been stressed for a super long time, the support you need is going to be different than, you know, if you think you're just coming up against a small period and to kind of answer one other question, I think that Lydia or Mar no, Marianne had, how long are you taking it? And I think, um, you know, Dr. Varden, you know, based on her environmental med experience, and then Adelia and I, based on some of especially the environmental or herbal training we've done, traditionally, a lot of ap adaptogens are kind of given physically. It's something to Adelia's point, can your body can get used to, and then it isn't as helpful. So there's an element of phasic. There's many traditions that inform that phasing. Um, and so it's really important to work with your provider because they would know kind of what sort of stress you're going under for how long, what does that look like? What other things are you doing? So we're not trying to avoid an answer. It's just so very important here to work with your provider because Dr. Varden's just listed this whole glorious family of mushrooms. Adelia's listed a lot of different herbs, right? All of these are things that can be drawn from and all of them should be taken in very different ways. Yeah. Agreed. All right. Um, and so that would also touch Lydia on your question around BPs, et cetera. You'd have to talk to a clinician as to whether um, with a lower blood pressure, is that appropriate for you? Okay. And I have one more thing I would like to add, if that's okay. If yes, you please. happen to be a woman in the perimenopause or menopausal years, so basically if you're a woman in your 30s, 40s, or 50s, and hormones may be a factor, another adaptogen I have to throw in is maca because it has some great uses and I prescribe it all the time. 
So that's a really good one because it affects your hormones in a positive way as well. So, yeah. I love that. Yeah. I love that. I was, um, I have a friend who, who's from the Caribbean, goes back to the Caribbean. She always comments whenever she goes back, she's like, it's everywhere. You don't have to pay for it. Whereas here, you know, we're always scourging and trying to find a good source. It's, it's interesting that you can find these sorts of things. I love finding them as Dr. Lara found her shaka. Right. Yeah. And then I love when we get to find our plant medicine out in the wild, literally. All right. Evelyn here is asking, uh, okay, the last question here. Okay, um, so Dr. Kosterman, I, I see the last question. And I actually have an answer for that last question that nobody knows is coming yet. So I thought I would take a moment and tell Evelyn. Guys, that, the voice of God is here. Let's hear it. <laughs> and God is female. <laughs> yes, yes, she is. And thank you for pointing that out. Uh, Evelyn, we have built an app for the DNA company and the app is in beta. We've been testing it for about two months now. And in the app, because Dr. Sapp is so strict about supplements and potential interactions, we actually put in the app itself, an interaction checker so that you can go to one of the largest public medicine spaces to check it against the allopathic medicine or other supplements to see if there is an interaction. So Evelyn, if you want to send me an email, uh, Katie, I know you're on, put my CEO email in the chat window, please. Send me an email, Evelyn, and I will let you participate with the beta for the next couple of days. And you can check your supplements against medications all you like and let me know what your thoughts are. That's great. Excellent. <laughs> okay, and that's all I had to add, ladies. I'm going back to play my Xbox, which is how I manage stress. God <laughs> provides us gifts. Good for you. <laughs> yeah, very much one of those old school gods that pops in and then pops out. <laughs> and we all have different techniques for managing stress, right? Yeah. yeah. Another point that's probably important to mention. <laughs> for Why? some people, it may be video games. You know, yeah. <laughs> and other than the dopamine discussion, but you know, the we're just beautiful trying to thing is <laughs> that it's different. The beautiful thing yeah. is, is that there are so many tools and techniques. So if you know, this one, that one, that one doesn't work for you. Well, we've got like a dozen more to choose from that you can try because sure enough, there is going to be a few that do work for you. So, and they, they don't, they may not always work at the same time but if you have a cache of you know techniques and tools pull from that you know find something that does work such a good point if you hate meditation you're not alone <laughs> so many of my patients hate meditation this is why we have a menu of options <laughs> yeah it's boring sometimes right <laughs> yeah. all in that that also, monkey brain that chatter it just yeah sometimes. if you're someone yeah. prone to anxiety meditation isn't necessarily the first go-to tool because it can kind of amp amplify that experience right and so it's Good. that's where you pick i i like to equate meditation to exercise right if i tell you to go exercise and you decide to go run and you hate running that doesn't yeah. mean you hate exercise it means you hate running and you should try something else right so dancing Yes, ma'am. <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> I love dancing. Not on camera. But... Dr. Dr. Martin and I did we'll a long stretch of webinars <laughs> together. And yeah. we danced in and out of all of them because actually, Dilly, you'll really like this. This there is a, a study that looked at exercise as an intervention towards um depression and we know that exercise is a really good intervention for mild to moderate severe as well severe you know you have to bolster with a few other things but mm -hmm. they said of the forms of exercise that which outperforms and offers the best benefit is dancing and so we've no been dancing way. in and out yes oh, ma'am oh, i will study okay, I that love it. i love it <laughs> I study. and so on that delightful little point of dance and music and nerdy science and all things that make the three of us exceptionally wow. happy <laughs> thank you everyone so very much for joining us this evening thank you for kind of taking time out of your day to 
noodle the idea of stress and really noodle what can be done at least on your end as to supporting it, be it something that needs to engage the mind or something that needs to engage the body or something that maybe needs to engage some plants and some adaptogens, whatever that might be. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Ladies, Dr. Varden, Dr. Sapp, Monsia, merci. Thank you so very much. Thank so, you so, so much to both of you and our audience. Yeah. Thank yes. you all. Have a great night, everybody.